Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I don't have to put my teacher voice on. Good. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, the uh, worship team just uh, is freshly back from the Kingdom House of Prayer in Ankeny. Um, we did a two-hour set last night as part of their 24-hour prayer burn. Um, happy to report that um, it was a much better experience, maybe. Is that, I don't know if that's the right way, way to say that, but um, it was much more fruitful. Uh, we felt, you know, very welcomed. Um, the uh, there's a spirit of unity by the end of the two-hour set. They were, we were really joining forces. Um, really blessed by Rick's blessing at the end for our church, um, as well as for the worship team. So it was a wonderful experience. There were a couple themes. You know how the Lord kind of knits together. Um, unbeknownst to Mike, he had pulled three scriptures to kind of focus our time on while we were there, and one of them was from Hebrews 12, which Nathan had just preached on the Wednesday prior. And um, unbeknownst to us, that was the theme all day long, was Hebrews 12, and it had been brought up over and over and over again. So apparently the Lord wants us all to be in remembrance of Hebrews 12, so I'm going to just uh, read a couple of snippets. <laughs> There's a, uh, you know, it, it's, God is so much bigger, right? He's so much bigger than just our God. He's so much bigger than just the God of our church, the God of our city, the God of our nation. And, and when he goes out of his way to make it very clear when something's on his heart and important to us, I think then we ought to pay attention. <laughs> um, so Hebrews 12, uh, verses 18, and I'll just read through the end of the, end of the verse. This is, again, the Message Bible for just a little different translation. This section is called An Unshakable Kingdom. Unlike your ancestors, you didn't come to Mount Sinai, all the volcanic blaze and earth-shaking rumble, to hear God speak. The ear-splitting words and the soul-shaking message terrified them, and they begged him to stop. When they heard the words, if an animal touches the mountain, it's as good as dead, they were afraid to move. Even Moses was terrified. No, that's not your experience at all. You've come to Mount Zion, the city where the living God resides. The invisible Jerusalem is populated by throngs of festive angels and Christian citizens. It is a city where God is judge with judgments that make us just. We've come to Jesus who presents us with a new covenant, a fresh charter from God. He is the mediator of this covenant. The murder of Jesus, unlike Abel's, a homicide that cried out for vengeance, but the murder of Jesus became a proclamation of grace. So don't turn a deaf ear to these gracious words. If those who ignored earthly warnings didn't get away with it, what will happen to us if we turn our backs on heavenly warnings? His voice that time shook the earth to its foundations, but this time he t he's told us quite plainly, he'll also rock the heavens. Mm. One last shaking from top to bottom, stem to stern. The phrase one last shaking means a thorough house cleaning, getting rid of all the historical and religious junk so that the unshakable essentials stand clear and uncluttered. Do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming, brimming over with worship, deeply reverent before God. For God is not an indifferent bystander. He's actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn, and he won't quit until it's all cleansed. Mm. God himself is fire. Mm. Yes. We don't have to fear the fire. No. There's nothing to be afraid of. You are unshakable. You are his kingdom. Yeah. And as we were praying about that, God, God kept telling me, you are the expression of his love. You are the expression of God's peace, and you are the expression of God's glory. We pray to see God's glory. We pray to see his face. Look around. We are God's face. We are God's glory. And as I was praying this morning, the Lord said, look for one person a day to tell God loves you. You know, it's, it's a little safer sometimes to say God loves you if you don't know where they're coming from. Tell them Jesus loves them. Our God has a name, yeah. the name above all names. Yeah. So look for one person a day that needs to hear God loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you, and he accepts you just exactly as you are. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be afraid of God. We don't go to Mount Sinai. We go to Mount Zion. Yeah, yeah. Grace and mercy is all we should ever expect from God. Yeah, yeah. 
You need another chance. You need a tenth chance. You need a hundredth chance. There are no chances. It is every day is new with God. Every moment is life and peace and love. And we need to show people who he is, be an expression of the love that they don't understand. Religion is not love. Religion is judgment. Religion is condemnation. Religion is you're never good enough. And that's what he's coming to destroy. That's what he's coming to shake from us, to, to get us so sure that we cannot be moved. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. That is the only thing that's going to be shaken. You will be so sure of God's love that nothing, nothing can shake us. You are unshakable, and we are part of an unshakable kingdom. So one person a day, and I guarantee you if you find one, you'll find two. Because they're all around us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Any uh, prayer requests or any testimonies this morning? Yeah, Jane. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah, Roberta. Uh, <coughs> I talked a little bit about this on uh, uh, Wednesday night. There's this girl that I work with that we've been friends for 20 years now. Uh, we went to a really hard time and it's just been just really tough thing. It's about three months ago.
And that's the little girl that was here when we did that outreach who didn't want to leave. I have a testimony. I shared it on Wednesday. Um, God is the God of more than enough. God is the God of abundance. God is the God of blessing us more than we can ask or think. And this week I got the biggest raise of my entire life. 
got the biggest raise of my career. And I would have been ecstatic with a 10% raise, but God said, no, I'm gonna give you a double portion. I got a 20% raise. Who gets a 20% raise in this economy? But I, God reminded me this morning as I was thanking him, Debbie had testified about changing her tithing, and this is not a message about tithing or anything, but I was moved when she said God challenged her to go from net tithing to gross tithing. <laughs> And that spoke to my heart. I thought, you know what? That's somewhere I can give more. And I honestly don't, I mean, I'm like everybody. I got a budget. I had to look. I had to think about it. But I believed. I've always believed in tithing. And I'm telling you, since I did that, I haven't asked for prosperity. I haven't asked for anything. I've been thanking God ever since. And I have thanked him. And there was the day the Gideons was here, and um, Don had a word. And God has reminded me of that day over and over. He said, that was a blessing. I blessed you. I chose to bring everybody here to pour out a blessing through your gifts. And it is through our giving. It's not just money, but it's through our giving that God can give us so much more that we can ask or think. Whether it's our time, whether it's our love, whether whether it's money. We can't outgive God. And God said so clearly today, this is the year of the double portion. So whatever you need... If you are lonely, then you give love like you've never given before. If you have relational needs, then you reach out and you, re- and you forgive as you've never forgiven. And you will bridge those gaps. If you have a financial need, you give. I don't care if it's, you know, somebody on the street. If it's someone, if, if it's a child, give them a dollar. You'll make their day. Give. Give, give, give. Because when we open our heart and when we open our hands, God, it just flows. And that is something that God just, he blows me away. I mean, how much more can he bless us? You know, but expect it. Like Jody said, expect it. And that, that doesn't mean asking. That means thanking God. That is really, that just shifts everything. Instead of asking, I don't have to ask for anything. My needs are met. I can just thank him in advance for whatever you need, whatever, whatever the area is in life. Just be thankful. Yes. Absolutely. See it, whether there's the yes. circumstances have changed in your face, they change in the spirit before they ever change you. Mm-hmm. Everything starts there. So I think that's a, a profound lesson <coughs> for us in whatever area we're doing. That would be in a health situation there. Mm-hmm. It was a financial mm-hmm. thing you're talking about, but it could be in anything. Anything, anything. yes. Well, and that's the other thing, as I was praying this morning, God reminded me, I can't multiply your thoughts. I can multiply the gifts you give. He wants to multiply. He doesn't want to add. He wants to multiply. And he can't multiply our thoughts, but he can multiply our gifts, whatever that may be, whether it's prayer, for healing. Yeah, Don. Yes. Now, that's a 
it sounds easy. You know, oh, I believe. No, mm-hmm. it's beyond belief. Mm-hmm. It's knowing. Yes. It's knowing yes. that it is as certain as the sun yes. coming up and going down. And that goes with all the problems that you get. Yes. Everything. But what he impressed on me was uh, that when we speak <coughs> in his name, we have to understand something. That first of all, we are nothing more than a vessel that he has sanctified, yes. that he has deemed worthy to use. Because the enemy will always come against us and try to convince us you're unworthy. And he's, in reality, he's right. Absolutely. Standing myself, I, I am totally unworthy. But I thought this morning in the shower, that's another way to say it. <laughs> yes. yeah. Brush my teeth in the shower. Yeah. That I could never be boastful. Never. Because I know me, and whatever happens in my life, whatever God does, is God. Yes, it is. Not me. That's right. I am incapable, but all of a sudden he impressed on me that we are just like he was. The works that we will do, it's the Father in us. Yes. It's the eternal spirit yes. that is in us that does those things. Yes, it right? is. And I thought, on me was that don't be afraid of who you're dealing with in the hierarchy of the enemy yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> because he will give us the power needed yes. at that particular moment. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now this power doesn't dwell on us all the time. It flows through us, but it is beyond imagination. Whatever mm-hmm. and then it Resurrection power. Yes. I will do it. Yes. Yeah. And I don't care if we need to raise ten dead. Mm-hmm. We cannot limit yes. this unlimited yes. power that God mm-hmm. is ready to pour out on us. But we got to get to the point that we know that we know that we know yes. His word is forever true. Yes. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Yes. 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 Because that's the only thing. Everything, folks, is set up. Yes. Yes. Every day we see the news. Yep.
we were rocking, James. We were rocking for Jesus. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Byron. the Lord.
appreciate you, Mary. Stand and go to the Lord. Jesus, we just thank you, Lord. Thank, thank you, Lord, you, for your faithfulness, Lord. We thank you that your word, your kingdom is unshakable. This undeniable truth, Lord, that we can build our lives upon the firm foundation, Lord, for all of our hopes. Jesus, you have provided everything, Lord. You have done it all. It is finished. We must simply believe, Lord. Continue to pluck out the unbelief and the doubt from our hearts, Lord. Illuminate the eyes of our heart, Lord, with your truth, of your word, Lord, with your presence, Lord, through the help of the body that you surround us with, Lord. Increase our belief, Lord, and forgive our unbelief, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful, Lord, faithful to prosper us, faithful to heal us, Faithful to raise those who die from the dead, if that is your plan, Lord. Jesus, give us eyes to see and ears to hear to follow after you, Lord, as you put your purposes and your plans. Lord, I thank you that you are knitting a body together, not just in this place, but throughout this city and throughout this nation and throughout this world, Lord. That as we are in these last days, Lord, that you are revealing your purposes and your plans, the hidden things in your word as never before that have been reserved for this time, Lord. Jesus, help us to see those that need hope. Help us to see those that need your love and your peace, Lord. Help us to be an expression of your grace, an expression of your glory to a world that is hurting and dying, Lord. Oh, Lord, as we thank you, Lord, as we give you thanks, let our cups run over with the joy and the peace that is knowing you, Lord, having your Holy Spirit one with us, Lord. Let our worship come from that place of intimacy, Lord, the place of knowing you, knowing that we cannot be separated from you, that your love is unfailing, that your love for us is unshakable, Lord, not earned but freely given. to join us together in this time, Lord, to join us, to link arms together, a mighty, powerful army for your kingdom, Lord, yes. to do battle for those, Lord, that hurt, to heal the brokenhearted, Lord, yes, Lord, to restore those that have been broken and hurt, Lord. We thank you and we give you all the glory. It is all about you, Jesus. It is all about you, Lord, and we just thank you that you selected us, Lord, that you chose us, Lord. We look to you and we give you all the thanks and glory in Jesus' name. Jesus. Sheila, can you take it up the first slide? <clears throat> that one. Uh, we do have a project coming in the spring. If you'll notice the steeple on the top, the cross is not there because the base is gone. You'll just see the steeple itself without the cross on it. That whole unit has to come down because it's all rotted wood underneath the new siding. It's up on the top side there. Uh, I got to pray for wisdom on how to get that rascal down. <laughs> I know we're going to have to go up in the attic and last I saw one pastor and I were up there is re-rod up there, or not re-rod, fritted rod about two foot long up in there that's way too long anyway <clears throat> pray about it because uh we'll use the uh, hid the high density wood to restore all this this thing this will be restored but you'll notice there's no cross on the top and it hasn't been for a few months <clears throat> and the and the lord was speaking to me in the spirit realm i, I see a lot of this in the spirit realm <clears throat> as if uh, we leave a void in a vacuum the enemy is going to come in and put in what he wants i mean can you see a crescent and a star on top there right now this is what happens in the spirit realm if we walk away from the situation, okay? So we'll restore the cross up there, uh, but I'm asking for volunteers and prayer to go for the strategy of how to get that rascal down. It may be a crane or a, ch a cherry picker, depending on how the weight of the rascal. And I know it's heavy because the wood inside is uh, saturated and uh, decomposed. 
you'll see on the bottom of the shingles as you walk out, all the wood underneath of it is all gone. It's gone. It's, it's all dissipated. <coughs> so this spring we will uh, get that rascal down. We will restore it and put it into a better situation than it was when it was new because we'll use the newer materials that are available now to have it last for a long, long, long time. So. And um, just one other announcement. We do have a calendar back there uh, for Sunday school. I believe we need some assistance at the end of February. So I think we're good through maybe mid-February. So praise the Lord. All right, let's speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law, therefore I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Uh, Don and Roberto, you guys want to come take the offering this morning? Please. <laughs> Please and thank you. <laughs> Don, will you ask the blessing this morning? I want to thank Kingdom House of Prayer in Heartland for hosting us last night and pray for blessings upon them. May your glory be in their midst this morning, Lord. Something was revealed last night. Some of you may not see my profile picture on Facebook. I've always interpreted it as a watchman on the wall. I know there's watchmen on the wall even in our midst, those that are praying for this church. And they're far and few and in between. It seems like if I would put it in my mind's eye, there's only one watchman on each wall facing the north and the south and the east and the west. And it felt like they're the only ones, just like I believe it was Elijah who thought he was the only one. And there were many more that were actually there. He just didn't realize it. <clears throat> but the watchmen on the wall, they're in our midst. Even as I saw when we were at the gathering last night, they are coming. They will not be alone. They will not be alone.
And as they were coming from the north and the south and the east and the west, taking their place upon the wall, I looked up and they were dancing. I couldn't understand, why are they dancing? Well, it's obvious. They were seeing things first. And they were seeing the return of the glory of the Lord coming first. They saw these things and they're rejoicing. They're saying, yes, the Spirit is upon us. And we are rejoicing and we are dancing. And yes, there is a wind blowing. We saw this. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Because there's a the wind blowing all across the land, a fragrant breeze of heaven blowing once again. Don't know where it comes from. Don't know where it comes from. Don't know where. Face 
outshine the brightest sun. You are so glorious. You are so glorious. With eyes that blaze like burning fire. Jesus, you're glorious. You are so glorious. King of glory, have your glory. King of glory, have your glory. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, you're worthy of our praise. face outshines the brightest sun. Jesus, you're glorious. You are so glorious. With eyes that blaze like burning fire. Jesus, you're glorious. You are so glorious. so powerful and in your hands you hold the stars Jesus, Jesus you're powerful you are so powerful King of glory have your glory King of voice like rushing water sounds Jesus you're powerful you are so powerful and in your hands you hold the stars Jesus you're powerful you are so powerful
Всю главу славу. Всю главу славу.
and they bring the message of grace. It's not just about singing songs, but it's really about ministering. Hallelujah. Breaking through where otherwise they may not be heard. Hallelujah. story talk about religion the two pastors were uh, from local churches they were standing alongside the road holding up some signs that read the end is near turn yourself around now before it's too late first car comes by he says get out of here you religious nuts why don't you just leave us alone and just seconds later they heard the screeching of tires and a huge splash. And the one pastor said to the other, you think we should just put up a sign that says bridge out? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> but the truth is, you know, when we're talking about uh, all of these kind of, uh, I guess you could call them religious mindsets and so forth, but it, it, it comes down to a very fundamental reality, and that is our focus needs to be Jesus. Our resource is the cross, the finished work of the cross, and the enabling month or the empowerment is the Holy Spirit, and if you put things in that order, you succeed. You'll be successful in whatever it is that you're dealing with. If you don't, the alternative to that is putting the focus on works and the resources then are our performance and we, the empowerment then becomes self. And it always leads to failure because you never can do everything that you want to do. You're never able to complete and finish all that you want or all that you have expectations for or desires for or needs for or anything else. So it needs to be Jesus, the cross, the Holy Spirit that will bring us into success every single time. That's basically what the Bible teaches us. We can do all things through Christ if the focus is on him and we draw the resources from the finished work of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, then the Holy Spirit is empowered because that's the only thing he'll work within. He, he only works within what God has done, what the finished work of the cross. From that, he can do all of those things. But when it becomes about us, now it's left up to us because God doesn't operate in the flesh, in the natural realm. I mean, from a natural realm. He operates in the natural realm, but he does it from the Spirit, by the Spirit. So, you know, it's not, this is not some radical viewpoint when we talk about focusing on Jesus. We're talking about that's the fundamental teaching of the Bible from beginning to end. So if we keep that in mind, it's a lot easier than when we try to talk about faith or you know, uh, believing or not believing or whatever. It's just about a focus on Christ, drawing from that finished work of the cross. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit's empowered then. Not only, as Don says, he, he not only flows through us, he flows out of us and impacts everything around us. Praise the Lord. So I appreciate all the testimonies this morning and uh, the songs that we've sung, uh, the, the, the brief uh, prophetic from... Uh, Mike at the beginning here because that kind of touches all of this kind of touches on what I want to talk to you about this morning which is not unusual it happens all the time for all of us but I never get tired of it praise the Lord so let's begin with uh, John chapter 8 and verse 36 <clears throat> praise the name of the Lord hallelujah if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen? All right, now Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Hallelujah. So freedom is something that, that we know is it's implicitly right, and we want it. I mean, people, not just in America, but everywhere, we, 
there's a, there, what our founding fathers said some very profound things, but I believe it was inspired by the Lord. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that we have a right, an innate right, a right from God to pursue a good life, right? The pursuit of happiness. It, it only happens where there's freedom. You don't find much happiness in a totalitarian state, in a dictatorial environment, amen? So freedom is something that every human knows is a right thing. It's, it, it, it's just, it just is, and everybody wants it. Praise the Lord. We are designed for it. We were created for it. Humanity, I'm talking about, amen? But in reality, we've got a real difficulty obtaining it. Praise the Lord. Because we're not always sure what it is. We think we know what it is, and we try to go out and get things that we think are going to make us free, and they don't. They end up becoming a bondage to us and a, a, a weight. Hallelujah. But we know it. We know we are supposed to be free. And we want to be free. But the truth is, not many of us really are free. Amen. And I'm talking about now, I'm speaking of Christianity specifically. And the thing about humans is that, that we were made for a very particular type of freedom. Amen. And we won't, unless we understand that, the principle that God is trying to reveal to us through the Word of God and through Christ, and then pursue it, we're never going to really experience true freedom. Hallelujah. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 and begin at verse 31. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now let's skip over to chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. God saw everything that he made, and he said, it's good. It's, it's very good. And then verse 7 here of chapter 2. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is ple pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now remember these scriptures as we go along. Now let's, let's look at, uh, see, Adam had a beautiful life with God. God had a, had a perfect plan for him, and Adam enjoyed that perfection. He enjoyed this relationship with God in the garden. It was a grace relationship. God provided everything and then put him there and let him enjoy it. You know, just put, it's all out there, right? So now look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Praise the Lord. Good and evil, law, religion. Praise the Lord. All right, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Praise the Lord. So Adam and Eve climbed the tree ate the fruit, jumped out of the tree, and died. Praise the Lord. Now, when I was a kid growing up, I don't know if I was unusual. I don't think I was, at least not for the kids in my neighborhood. I was climbing trees all the time. And if I wasn't climbing a tree, I was on top of somebody's garage. I wanted to get up in the air. And, and my mother would just carry on. You're going to kill yourself. Get out of that tree. You know, you're on a little limb. And, of course, I fell plenty of times and had scrapes. and But I, I didn't die, but she was sure that I would. Get off of that garage. What's wrong with you? You're going to kill yourself. And it went on for everything. And then we got BB guns at a certain age. And, you know, you all seen the movie. 
You'll put your eye out. Don't. You're going to kill one another. And then we got shotguns. Now we could really do some damage, praise the Lord. And it was, my mother, I don't know how she lived through our childhood because she was panicked all the time. You're going to kill each other. Then we got rifles so we could do it from a further distance, praise the Lord. She just, she was constantly saying things like, you kill each other. You're going to kill, you're going to kill yourself. Amen. Amen. I got 19, and I joined the Marine Corps. I wasn't content with jumping out of trees. I wanted to jump out of helicopters. I, I, I just wanted to have an adventure. I wanted to, you know, this wasn't about being the most patriotic person in the world. I love my country, but at that time at 19, I didn't know a whole lot about that. I just wanted to experience something. Amen? Now, when you're young, you're immortal. That's why... We have 18, 19 year olds joining the military and not 35 year olds. Because when you're 18 and 19, you don't think you're ever going to die. It's always going to be somebody else that dies. You're not going to die. Amen? And see, we, we see life as a child, as a young person, and it's, it's full of possibilities. And you assume that you're never going to die. But as you get older, you know better. Right? But there's something to be learned from both of these perspectives. Don't be stupid, but don't be a coward either. Young people are trying to capture life by living it to the fullest. That's why you drive 90 miles an hour. That's why you jump off of garages. That's why you climb up trees and jump out. That's why you join the military, whatever it is. You, 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 the way I think I'm going to capture life, the way I'm going to understand it is by living it completely. That's why we got people bungee jumping and jumping out of perfectly good airplanes, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Why? Because they want to experience life to the max. Amen? And as you get older... You're trying to capture life by making sure you don't fall out of the airplane. <laughs> Amen? Or that you don't slip off the roof when you're trying to fix something. Or that you don't fall out of the tree. So we're doing some of the same things. We just don't want the same results. Amen? We're trying to get something different. Praise the Lord. Because life is this precious, fragile, adrenaline-filled, moment-by-moment offer of possibilities. It might be the possibility of excitement, or it might be the possibility of death. Life is filled with both, and the older you get, the more you realize that. So let's look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. That's all right. It has to be. You're clear back there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm not going to mess with you anyway. You know that truth. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Praise the Lord. So maybe life is, is really like I was when I was a, in like junior high school. When we had these, those junior high dances, where most of us guys would hug the wall for the whole night. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Maybe not you, but that was me. Because dancing might have looked like fun, but I was terrified to have everybody watch me do it. And so were most of my friends. So instead of dancing, we'd hang out with one another and make fun of those that were dancing. What's, they're, they're having spasms. You know, I grew up in those years, late 50s, early 60s, so I saw some weird dances. I didn't do many of them, but I saw them. I, w I could slow dance. I would slow dance. 
My mother even forced us. She thought she was going to get us cultured somehow, and she made my brothers and I go to a dance studio. There used to be a dance studio in Highland Park above Klein's department store there, just down from Chuck's Pizza. It was the most humiliating experience of my life. The only good thing was my two younger brothers had to take tap dancing lessons. <laughs> I didn't. But I did have to learn the other stuff. And she did the same way with musical instruments. We all had to play an instrument. It, just, it was one of those things. But I still, to this day, tease my younger brother for the tap dance. They'd come home, and it was shuffle, scratch, step. <laughs> he never heard the end of that. That I was always, how about scratching a step out here for me, Jim, you know? And just humiliating. But Dancing looks like fun, but if you're self-conscious, you just kind of hang on the wall and make fun of everybody else that's doing it. Jeremiah <coughs> chapter 1 and verse 5. So I'm just telling you how I got to be the compulsive uh, obsessive individual that I am today, praise the Lord. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, that's true for every one of us. God says he's, we are all kings and priests. This is, a, this is a truism for every living Christian, for every person in this room. Now, I, I want to live life fully. I always have. And I don't want my life to be limited by fear or insecurity. I want to live the life that God made me for. Now, when it comes to faith, most of us don't really live fully. We don't dance. We hug the wall. We keep it safe because people are watching. But you see, uncertainty is the place where God meets us in our fear and asks us to dance. That's called faith. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27. that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I bet if I ask you, each, each one of you would have an image of the church. I mean, somehow an idea in your own mind of what the church is. Now, I do. I have my own image of that. And I've seen my share of goofiness and stupidity when it comes to something that's supposed to be the church. I hate the, the, the tabloid, you know, TV version of the church. But the sad truth is a lot of times we've earned that reputation by being goofy and stupid. I mean, I'm talking about the, ch the church in general. I'm not being specific here, but I'm just saying you, it doesn't take you long to flip the dial through Christian television to where you're embarrassed to even watch it. I mean, the only way I can watch it is because there's no unbelievers in the room with me. If there were, I'd flip the channel. I'd turn it off. I'd run like my hair was on fire because it's idiotic, some of it. It's embarrassing. Praise the Lord. But the image that's given by the Bible is this amazing garden that's full of every kind of plant, fruit, flowers, vegetables, trees. It's not pristine. It's organic. But it's beautiful just the same. Because it's God's plan. It's God's what God wants it to be, not our interpretation of it, not our 
you know, trying to manifest it, just the reality of what it really is. So let's look at 2 Corinthians, if you will, chapter 5 and verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's the key to this conversation Paul's having. We are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. So when Paul, whenever Paul talked about Christ, he persuaded people. That's what we've all been talking about here this morning. He didn't show up and condemn them. He didn't rule them with laws and regulations. He persuaded them. He said he had been a rule keeper. He said, I kept more rules than anybody. And I kept them really good. But he said when it was all said and done, I realized it was just crap. It was dumb. Amen? So if our lives, if they don't reveal the freedom in Christ... Our faith won't persuade others to be attracted to God. That's the truth. To the outside world, religion appears to be confining. It looks claustrophobic. It looks like anything but freedom. The love that compelled Paul came from a very different God. One of grace, one of mercy, one of love, one of freedom. Mike was talking about the other night at the uh, prayer, you know, like 45 minutes to have a breakthrough and uh, not to be too presumptuous, but part of the reason for that is simply you've got to overcome all the tradition, all the expectation, all the limitations that are already there because they People are, you know, it's amazing, but people are intimidated by grace. They're intimidated by freedom. They want freedom, but they really don't know what freedom is. Galatians chapter 4, uh, verse 28, and I want to read right on through to chapter 5, verse 1, Sheila. So it's Galatians 4, 28 through 5, 1. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so it is now. It's okay. Let me just read it to you. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so, it is now. And I can echo that. Even so, it is now. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so, it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Cast out the works, the performance. That's how we got Ishmael. He's the son of the bondservant. Isaac is the son of promise. They can't be in the same house. Praise the Lord. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Stand fast, therefore, in that liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Right. So many, if not most, Christians are compelled by guilt and not love and grace. Amen? Amen. 
Being compelled by guilt doesn't make for a persuasive life. You're not going to persuade people with your guilt and your shame. Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 7 through 9. This is where I think we have so limited the Holy Spirit. Because as we began, I said, you know, it's either works, performance, self, and failure, or else it's Jesus, the cross, the Holy Spirit, and success. You mix them, and you've got a confused, chaotic, schizophrenic kind of church. The only one that is guaranteed to work according to the scripture is Jesus, the cross, the Holy Spirit. Amen. You did run well. What did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Okay, you got the focus on Jesus when you got saved. But something happened between Jesus, the cross, and the Holy Spirit empowerment. The focus got shifted. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. So there's, a, there's something else out there that's trying to persuade people besides Jesus. And it's this mixture of the bondwoman and the promise, the law and grace. And where you get that in the house, you've got conflict because you've got sibling rivalry like on steroids, which is what we still got going on in the Middle East. It's not just in the Middle East. It's everywhere. Amen. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Praise the Lord. So a little bit of that is like having it all that way. <coughs> See, nobody out there, no unsaved person is saying, I wish I had what you had because you seem so miserable and guilt-ridden. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Or, I wish I knew what you know about God so I could feel like he's disappointed in me too. <laughs> creation wasn't some divine scheme to get people to need God. We saw creation was about God's love overflowing for man. So when people are born again, likewise, the church is not God's scheme or some, you know, backhanded way of trying to get people to do stuff for God. The church is supposed to be an overflow of God's love and provision. What he wants to do for us, to redeem us, to save us, to bless us. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So people who live persuasive lives experience new creation. They're not living under the old thing. They're, they're in a new environment altogether. They are in a kingdom. Amen? So, yep, we jumped out of the tree. We jumped off the roof. But God caught us, redeemed us, and restored us. He was my mother, a lot more like God than I realized. Don't jump. Stay out of the tree. Get off the roof, you'll kill yourself. Which is exactly what God told Adam and Eve. You get up in that tree and start eating of stuff that you shouldn't be eating of, and it's going to kill you. But they thought freedom meant get up there and eat the poison. Get up there and jump out of the tree. Leap off the roof. I need more. Not realizing they had it already. And the result of this restoration, the result of God not letting us fall from his hands, the result of God's 
redemption is that now we can dance like nobody's watching. Amen? We can get as freaky and as goofy and as, you know what I'm talking about in the, in the spirit. I'm not talking about being stupid, but I'm talking about being free. We can dance without being intimidated. We can be ourselves. We can reach out to people. We can mix. We can get involved. We can interact. And we don't have to worry what people are thinking or what they're saying or, or what they're expecting. We can persuade people by our freedom. We can have freedom to enjoy life without fear, without intimidation without anxiety. The promise and the hope of the gospel is that our past isn't going to dictate our future. For anybody, for everybody. But we are a new creation, so we need to dream new dreams. We, ha we need to have new hope, new freedom from guilt, from shame, from anxiety, from fear, from anything that would hinder us from being a persuasion for God. Now, I know we all had those feelings, just like Roberto said. We've all experienced that, where the, where the people, I don't, I'm not a believer. Well, one of the reasons they're not a believer is because they don't really know what we believe. They only know the goofy. They only know the stupid. They only know the silliness and the, and the strangeness that they've seen, and they think that's it. That doesn't persuade. That freaks. We persuade them by what God's grace is really all about. This isn't about you. you don't, I don't care if you failed at everything. If you can just believe what I'm telling you, you'll become a success. You'll be a success immediately, even though your life is all screaming failure. There are no failures in Christ. We may fail, but we're not failures. We have been declared the righteousness of God in Christ, and the only difference between them and us is we have the freedom to enjoy it. We have the liberty to live our lives in peace without fear of judgment and ramifications because of my behavior because it's all been taken care of it's all been dealt with when people see that they see our freedom and they understand that to be the relationship we have with god it's persuade that's a persuasive argument it's like i was talking about don and jane it's, it's like suzanne it's like all of us here have had prayers answered there's nothing more persuasive than to see the love of god operating in somebody's life amen, amen? I guarantee you, when you talk about healing, when you talk about financial, you persuade more people to think about trusting God or believing in this God than you could in a million years by giving them all the rules, all the regulations, all of the fears of hell and damnation and judgment. Because, listen, we all knew about that, and it didn't stop us from doing stuff anyway, especially when we were younger. Because we figured, I'll get my act together when I'm about 55 or 60. Amen. Because right now, I want to live life. I want freedom. And they don't even know what freedom is. They're in bondage to their fears and don't even know it. They're out trying to prove something by killing themselves so that they can prove that they're not in bondage. Am I right? I mean, Adam and Eve climbed the tree, ate the poisoned apple, if you will, committed suicide for what? To prove that they were free. They were already free. They had grace. They had it made. They had, it was perfect. They didn't even need to go near the tree. But they had to have something make them feel, make them think, experience See, this freedom invites us into a courageous life. Praise the Lord. That persuades others. Just think of it like, uh, I, 
I was watching a thing on the Civil War the other day. In fact, it was yesterday afternoon, I think. <clears throat> on uh, on DirecTV, it's on the uh, Newsmax 349 if you have DirecTV. But anyway, it was, uh, I, and of course we've all read these things and we've seen it in war of all eras, but the, uh, the northern troops were being uh, routed by a uh, rebel uh, charge against their lines. This was at Gettysburg, I think, but it doesn't matter. It happened everywhere. But one guy dances with wolves, you know. He gets on his horse. He rides out and starts waving his sword. And he says, turn around. We can take him. You know, we'll do it, blah, 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 whatever. He got out in front and showed this tremendous courage, and it inspired everybody else. Now, the bullets were flying just like they were before. The cannon are going off. People are still dropping and dying. But something about this one person's courage persuaded all of these other people to turn around and take risks that they otherwise would not want to take. That's what our lives are supposed to be. We're supposed to be encouraged by God, to have courage to come off the wall and dance, to jump from the tree knowing God's going to catch me, to slide off the roof knowing that God's going to let me crash. We show courage. We show expectation of good. And that persuades people. And the only way you can do that is by being focused on Jesus. That's what the world needs. That's, that's what the church is supposed to be. No matter what it is, that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be this great persuader, this persuasive reality that causes people to say, man, I want some of that. I want that. It's this great, honest commercial for God. Praise the Lord. When God's people are set free, and that's why I believe I think I heard somebody say this. I don't know if it was here this morning or if I just heard it somewhere. But in the last days, you see, God said this in the scripture. Judgment begins at the house of the Lord. Now, that's not a, a shouldn't be a scary thing. It should be that God's looking here first for answers for the world. And it says this, that God once winked at ignorance what we call sin, self-effort, right. self-works. But in the last days, we're in those days. And I think God's through winking at the mixture that we've called the church. Now, he's let it, because it's producing something, but it's not producing what it's supposed to be producing. And so it's gone on because, as, as was said here, the, there is a fullness of time. I don't know how all that works, but I do know we've got to be very close to that. And because of that, God's going to quit winking at what we've been doing and calling Christianity. And judgment's going to begin here where God's going to say, either this is going to be a message of my grace, my mercy, my love, a persuasive message, or it's not going to be at all. It's going to get shook loose. Because the only thing that can't be shaken is going to be what I established by my grace, not by your effort, not by your works, not by your indulgences, not by anything other than what I have declared. And in order for God to be everything God wants to be, that has to be the reality that the church works from. That will persuade others that Jesus is God. In other words, the, the, the revelation of this beautiful Christ, this good, gracious, merciful, loving God is who God really is is that that's how God really is. God's not angry. God's not mad. God's not vicious and vengeful. Praise the Lord. He wants us to dance. Hallelujah. He wants us to have a good time. He wants us to live free. Amen. Now, let's, one more scripture here and then we'll, we'll wrap up. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And let's start with uh, verse 13 through 16. 2 Samuel 6, 13 through 16. 
And it was so that when they bear the ark of the Lord, when, when they bear the ark of the Lord, they'd gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. This is speaking about David. Now, how many of you know the ark of the Lord, we've talked about it a lot of times, the lid on the, on the ark is the mercy seat. In, in the Greek, it's called elasterion. I've, I've taught about this before. That is Christ. He is elasterion. He is the mercy seat. What does that represent? It set on top so that you couldn't see into the ark and see the tablets of the law. It put mercy between judgment and law. It put grace covering that. That's what that represented. That's why when they, in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, which I believe to be a true story, <laughs> and they removed the lid of the ark, ooh, it's devastating. It kills everything that comes in contact with it. Well, that, the principle was true, even though it was all dramatized and it was a movie and there was very little spiritual understanding there. But the, the, the principle still remains the truth. Without that mercy seat, we are subject to judgment. We're subject to those laws. Right? So that's what's happening here. David's having a celebration. He's partying like it's 1999. He got off the wall. He's dancing. He's going crazy because... He understands mercy has come. There's mercy, so he's offering up sacrifices to the Lord every six steps. I mean, he's doing the boogaloo, uh, whatever. He's doing the whatever that dance was. And uh, I, like I said, I spent most of my time on the wall. I, I just picked up the quirky things that I could point out to make fun of somebody else. But nevertheless, he's doing it all. He's got the mood. He's just having a time and every six steps he stops, offers up a sacrifice, gets back up and takes off again. Right? So he's, he's just having a blast. And he danced before the Lord with all of his might and David was girded with a linen ephod. He was having a strip tease. It was just you know, he's beside himself. He just could not get free enough. That's what he's representing here. I'm the king, and I don't even care. I don't care what this looks like. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy the presence of the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, or Michael Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing. She's up against the wall. She's, she's like me, the junior high boy. She's standing there watching David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in, his heart, in her heart. She mocked him. She thought, look at this idiot. Boy, if they don't realize how stupid they look out there dancing like that. I, I'm so together. Right? All right, let's go on to uh, chapter, or ver, excuse me, same chapter, Verse 17, very next verse, and go through to verse 23. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. As soon as David had made an end of the offering, burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Now watch what happens here. This freedom, look at what freedom brings. And he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel as well as to the women as men, to everyone a cake of bread, a good piece of flesh, and a flagon of wine. David said, when you get free, party. God will provide. To everybody in Israel, he gave them that. A side of beef, a loaf of bread, a magnum of champagne. I don't know what it was, some, a big bottle of Chianti, whatever you prefer. He gave him some wine. He gave him something to celebrate, to enjoy, to have experience, freedom. Don't just have freedom. Celebrate it. Amen. And he dealt among all the people, even the whole multitude. So let's go on. And then David returned to bless his household. He blessed everybody outside. Now he's going to go and he's going to put a particular blessing on his own house. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David. This is his wife. And she said, how glorious was the king of Israel today? How stupid did you look today? What an idiot. Who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants. Before these people, you made a fool out of yourself. These nobodies, 
These nothings. And in the eyes of the handmaids of a servant, and one of the vain fellows shamelessly, you uncovered yourself. Right? Now, I don't know, but when I was standing against that wall and I'd see, I can't even remember the names. There was one kid that could really dance. He didn't finish school with us, but he was going to our school then. I can't remember his name now. But he was kind of a greaser at the time. Not a, that does, that's not a, mean a dirty person, but it means he <laughs> did the brill cream thing with his hair. had a slick back, you know, duck tail and all that. But he could dance. But we never said he could dance, even though we all knew that he could dance. Right? We saw it as though he was an idiot. I mean, he's, look at that. And secretly, we all wanted to be able to do that. Inside, we all wished that we had the guts to get out there and do what he did. Because he was getting some girls. Because <laughs> the girls like to dance. But we didn't. We were afraid. And so he said, I, before the Lord, who chose me before the Father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel, therefore will I play before the Lord. And I will yet be more vile than thus and will be base in my own sight. This is kind of like what Paul was saying here a few weeks back. I said, I don't care what you think. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't even care what I think. Of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of them, shall I be had in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. Praise the Lord. So here's the moral of the story. Dance like David or judge like Michael. Get happy or get hung up. Amen. Criticize or love. David dances, David's free. He's living fully. He's doing stuff he never dreamed that he would do. He don't care. I don't care if people are watching. This is between me and the Lord. He was God conscious. He was grace conscious. Before his time, before the time had even come, he made things change. And then if you think about the dispensations, David had the ability, because of his faith in God's grace and mercy, to mix dispensations, to cause things to happen in a dispensation that shouldn't happen for another 2,000 years. But because he believed in the mercy and the grace of God, God allowed it to him to experience it. When people all around him were being judged. He got loose. He got free. He danced. And God celebrated with him. Michael is standing there critiquing every step that he takes, every move that he makes, everything that he does. She is totally self-conscious. And the result was this wall hugger produces nothing. Absolutely zilch. No, she's barren. It's easy to stand against the wall and mock everybody else that's trying to do something, that's trying to be persuasive. That's what religion does. When you go out and offer, try to persuade people with the love of God and with the grace of God, religion has a tendency to stand back and say, man, that's vile. That is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Look what they're doing. Look at how they're behaving. You know, they're getting right down in there with them. You know, I saw Nathan come out of a bar. I bet he had a beer. He come out of a restaurant somewhere, and they serve beer. In there. Well, hey, I got news for you. You might catch me even drinking a beer, because I'm not hiding. Amen. I'm not promoting it. I'm saying you don't reach the lost at church. You got to be where they are. You got to sometimes look as vile and as debased as they are. I'm not saying you are. I'm not saying to do things just because they do it. I'm not going to go out to some crack house and start shooting up meth because I know there's people in there that need to be saved. But I'm not afraid to talk to them, right. deal with them, interact with them, right. whoever they are, whatever they are. Right. And the church is saying, no, wait, you've got to repent. You've got to get your act together. You've got to 
you got to straighten up. You've got to turn around. Turn your life around. And we got people crashing into the rivers, amen, because that's the only message they're ever hearing. They're not hearing, God loves you. Be careful. The bridge is out. They're hearing, the end is near. God's going to get you if you don't get your life together. And they're going, you know, you, 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 know, you religious nuts. Praise the Lord. Take a leap. That's what I'm saying. God's there to catch you. Dance like nobody's watching. And you're going to persuade others of the freedom that we have in Christ's love, that we have in grace. Amen? That's my message this morning. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Jump. Just take a leap. Bust a move. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Play my flute of flown. I was, I've done that. My neighbor came over and caught me doing it. I was doing it like nobody was watching. But he was watching. Praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. I had rats running in every direction when I played that thing. <laughs> I was playing it so loud and so free that I never heard anybody at the door. And as I did my little parade down through the, from the living room out into the hallway by the front door, I happened to look up, and there was him and his wife. I persuaded them to get free. <laughs> but you know what? I had the greatest relationship with that guy as a result of that. He saw me, and he knew I was a pastor. I'm, I'm sure it, his religious mind took a heck of a blow that morning. <laughs> but we had a great relationship until he passed away here just last year. But Because uh, he, he could be open with me. And I was open with him. Hey, look, you know, I'm crazy, so what? I love Jesus, you know? we got to quit worrying. Quit, quit being afraid to dance. Quit being afraid to be free. That's what people are longing for. People want, you know, I, I don't, I've said this before. I don't tell people that I'm a pastor unless they ask me. I'm not going to lie to them, but I don't go out everywhere I go and say, yeah, well, the, I'm Pastor Hamlin, and, Reverend Hamlin, and I'm all this stuff. I don't do that because the moment you open your mouth and say that, you've lost your credibility with 90% of the population because they just figure, wait, of course he's going to say that. That's how he makes a living. My, my, the guy that does my dry cleaning, he's a great guy. He's always, you know, asking us to pray for them. And, you know, we, I've talked about him different times. I was in there, this has been a month or so ago, and he said, uh, Nathan, here's somebody you ought to meet. And I'm standing there in a hooded sweatshirt, a old pair of Levi's and tennis shoes. I'd been picking up some stuff for the, for the yard, <clears throat> salt and some things. I forget now what it was. But anyway, I, I look about like I usually do when I'm not in church. And, uh, of course, I had at that time I had the, the whole Duck Dynasty thing going. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> he introduces me, and it's the dean of the Baptist Christian College there in Ankeny. And the guy read off his whole resume, not just his title, but his degrees and everything else. And I'm standing there like this. And I said, well, it's nice to meet you. I'm Nathan. And he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I, I pastor a church on the east side. And he looked at me. And he looked over at Dan, the guy that has the dry cleaners. And I, I swear I saw his head move like this. And he just turned around and walked out. But I thought, you know, good for him. I mean, I, I don't have a thing against that, except that <coughs> that's his identity. That's, that's who he is, you know. Well, I'm a pastor, but I'm a child of God. I have a relationship with the Lord. That's what's important to me. This is, just, this is something I do, but that's what I am. But he was more interested in telling me, you know, what his, what his titles were than anything about the Lord. 
And I thought, you know, this is amazing because when Dan wants prayer for his grandson, for relationships within his family, he asks me. He doesn't go to the dean, the PhD in theology. He goes to the guy that looks like he could be using some help of his own. You know, he could, he could maybe need a little prayer for himself because he knows I'm real. He knows that this is what I, I'm not trying to push anything, but I think we persuade more people by just being real, by just being honest. Amen? You know, by just dancing. That's, I, you know what I mean? You, I hope you know what I mean by that. I'm not talking about being goofy. I'm talking about just being free, just being yourself, not feeling like you've got to put on a religious facade to, to talk to somebody. People, they, they would love to know that it's okay for me to have flaws and have a, a confidence that God loves me anyway. So it's not a bad, terrible thing for people to see that you might be flawed. You know, we, I'm not saying parade our weaknesses, our, our whatever, but I'm saying just be you and don't worry about it. Just dance through life as though nobody's watching, and you'll be surprised how much more persuasive that can be if people know that you're a Christian to see that they're just enjoying life. It doesn't look claustrophobic. It doesn't look binding and, and bound up and fearful. It looks like they can enjoy life. They can have vacations and they can, they can go places. They can do things. And they don't have to go on vacation to have a good time. If you understand what I'm saying. There was a time we had to go on vacation to get away from everybody else in the church so they wouldn't know, you know what we do on vacation. Praise the Lord. That we might, come on, that we might go swimming. That we might... <laughs> Mixed bathe, and I don't mean in a bathtub. I'm talking about in the hotel pool or something. You know what I'm saying? I know the extreme of this. I know going to conferences and preaching in conferences where half of the pastors wouldn't come to the conference because they were up in the hotel room watching a football game on TV, which they couldn't have at home. <laughs> the hypocrisy was just unbelievable. But we... Religion has this. You know, I'm not going to just make fun of my original organization. We, all of religion does that to some degree or another. And don't you believe for a moment that the world doesn't see that and know that something is not right about this. So the more open, the more real you are, the more honest you are, the more you that you are, the more God's going to have the opportunity to show through and touch people's lives. It's not, we're not going to win them. I heard it said here this morning, we're not going to do it. But the God in us, when we become us and quit trying to be God, just be you and allow God then to shine through you, you can have an impact. You can have a persuasiveness that you never dreamed of. Amen? Amen. That will change this world. Amen. That will bring in this great end-time revival that we know God has promised. Yeah. And we should be part of it. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. God bless all of you. Have a great week. Do a little dancing. Hallelujah. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.